Put your hands together for the hosts of Dev Central Connects live from their home studio, Boo Lamb and Jason Rom. Hey there, community. I am Jason Rom, but I do not have Boo Lamb with me today. He is still on a beach somewhere with the feet up, and or maybe they're in the sand. I don't know. Boo, are you a feet in the sand or above the sand guy? Let us know if you're watching. Uh, although I think you know, depending on, I don't want to. I want to sell out his location, so I won't even share like the time difference from where I am because you guys will probably figure it out if I do. But he's got his feet up or in the sand, or maybe he's got his drone flying 500 meters above him and you know tons of great video coming out of his vacation i can't wait to talk to him about it when he gets back but today we have a fantastic show for you and we're going to talk about network infrastructure automation and we're not just going to talk about it we're going to see it and so i'm really excited about that uh, but before we get into that i want to bring on my co-host for the show not boo lamb in fact it is peter Silver. peter welcome to the show and aloha Taboo, if that's any hint on where he might be. Oh wow! So I wasn't going to sell you out, Boo, but uh, but Peter just dropped the bomb there. <laughs> I don't think he was shy about it. Yeah, yeah. So but, you know, Peter, I you know, as we do every time when we start these shows, I, I have a question for you. And, fire away! Uh, before I drop the question, I wanted to uh, draw uh, just make a mention. My 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 little four year old son is is obsessed with like all things engineering um i had two boys before him who were on robotics teams and they both loved the soft skills the marketing the finance the project management talking to the judges all the relational stuff uh neither of them were that interested in the robot my four-year-old wants to get <laughs> to robotics he's going to be all about the robot so I'm, I'm really excited about that um but i dropped in the link this youtube video uh that we were watching and uh, this guy named Jared Owens has a as a 3D animation channel where he kind of breaks down mechanisms and how they work and all that. And this one that we watched yesterday is on Big Ben, uh, which uh, for those of you who don't know, Big Ben is uh, is a clock tower in London uh, next to the uh, you know attached to Parliament. Uh, what I didn't know that I learned in the video is that Big Ben is actually the Big Bell, not the clock tower. Everybody calls the clock tower. The, Big Ben, but it's actually just the bell. It's Elizabeth Tower <laughs> is is what uh, uh, you know Big Ben resides in. But anyway, all that to say, go watch the video and all of his other videos because they're fantastic. And uh, my question for you is, what is your favorite timepiece, uh, either from your childhood or do you have like a grandfather clock? What's your favorite timepiece? My favorite timepiece. So I don't I don't have it anymore. But when I was in seventh grade, we had a Japanese exchange student come stay with us. And one of the things that that he brought, uh, you know, for gifts and stuff was this pretty cool Seiko watch. And they used to I don't even know if they're around anymore. They still might be. But um, I loved it. It actually was sort of like this shaped. It had a little dial uh, clock. In the upper left, it had the digital, you know, the old LCD digital stuff down below. I could set alarms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I still, I like, I, every time I go through like my old stuff, it's one of those things like, oh, I wonder if that's still somewhere because I really, and then later in life, later in life, I bought myself a nice tag. It was one of those like, ooh, I got to get one of those. Rolex was never kind of my, I don't know, that just seemed too, uh, I don't know, too bourgeois, I guess, to get that. But, the, you know, the tag was one of those. So I got that. It needs a new battery. It's somewhere around here. But no, my seventh grade Seiko. Okay. Yeah, for me, it'd be my, my when we lived in Italy, uh, my dad was military. Uh, we got this grandfather clock. And I always loved to, you know, move the weights up and and uh, you know reset the pendulum and and uh, hearing the quarter quarter on the hour chimes and the bells and and all that. It was just really great. So like, fast forward to adulthood, and I actually had it at my house for a little while, but we're in the process of selling the house, and so you know my brother has it now. It's in his it's his in his living room, but you know my my grandfather clock could probably be mine. Was it the so. kind? Because we had one where you on the inside you had to open the little door. 
pull down the the chain for the weights to yeah. you know bring bring the weights back up and then that's you know kind of what then kept time over yep. time absolutely and incidentally if you go watch that video i shared uh big ben works the same way it's still on the the little things for the chimes and the bell strike for the for the hour clock and the timepiece um <laughs> and uh and the you know at least one of them is still controlled manually uh it's not even on electric motor so it's 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 crazy all right. Well, let's let's uh, let's bring Sebastian on, and uh, and we'll get his timepiece, and then we'll get into this. Sebastian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So, uh, guest today, Sebastian Maniac from uh, uh, actually, how do you pronounce? Is it Maniac or Maniac? Uh, you can say Maniac. Yeah, it, I kind of like Maniac. Damn right, you it, can it say seems that. Like it's kind of dangerous, one. right? Yeah, it's yeah. more fun when you say maniac. <laughs> That's right. Um, okay, so I, I have a couple questions for you, but first right, off, do you, you have a, a favorite timepiece from your childhood? Um, I, I do actually have a Seiko from my first communion my grandma got me. That's the first oh, wow. thing, right? Nice. Uh, I like this gold one. Uh, I don't wear it. it. It's actually still in my uh, uh, in my closet with my other ones, um, mostly because it doesn't work. I, I just I think I just have it. But as we're moving right now, um, maybe I'll try to fix it after this conversation. Uh, but also, I have a, a nice Hamilton my wife bought me for uh, when we were getting married. Um, so I love wearing that watch. It's like this big watch. It's all um, analog and stuff like that. It, it, it's so cool. Um, so I, that would be one of them, yeah. But other than that, yeah, Seiko, awesome. and now I just have an Apple Watch and a Whoop and stuff like that. So um I just have to charge those every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. My Apple Watch is like if, if I if I don't put it on at night, every night when I go to sleep, it's like yeah, ten percent power by about six yeah. o'clock. I'm like, come on, <laughs> like a little bit more battery life, people. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I try to charge it when I'm sitting down. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so you're you're an MVP, uh, you know, with with our community. Um, you know, you've been on the show before. Uh, how, if we back up a little bit, how did you get into technology period? Did you go to school for it or, or, you know, were you into it even before you went to school for it? And where, where was your connection to technology? Oh, I was into it before school. Um, mostly like, I remember when I migrated to Canada, uh, from Poland, uh, my uncle and my dad bought me like a 386 PC, um, they're running DOS, whatever, three or six at that time. I don't even know. I don't remember, but just playing video games, Duke Nukem and stuff like that, that got me into IT. Then I started building my own computers through elementary school and high school. Um, then I went to Sheridan College um, where I've learned more about networking. Um, so that piqued a lot of my interest in that space. So, and I actually teach there right now. I teach the same course or the same program that I graduated from uh, oh, cool. 15 years ago. Um, they asked me to teach. So I teach actually their uh, two programs. Um, I, I just love tech and I love passing along information to students and seeing them grow itself, like how I grew in that program. Yeah. yeah. Well, they say too, it's like you really start to understand something when you teach it. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> There's certain things I don't understand. I'm like, Oh no, I get it. Like this is how it comes together. I'm just like saying it a bunch of times. Yeah. It's the simplest yeah. thing too. Right? right. Are you, are you using the same, um, I guess, curriculum that, you were taught back then like you just adopted no. it as <laughs> no i revamped the whole curriculum uh there um one of the courses i teach is network security um so there's a lot of it around tcp and tcp dump and understanding the tcp or UDP protocol um so i kind of revamped it to make it more current i i find i think out of all the courses that i've ever taken that course that talked about you know, a couple of weeks of just TCP, how TCP works and understanding it, um, I've used throughout my entire career yeah. by, you know, analyzing TCP dumps, understanding Cincinnati, looking inside of uh, the TCP headers, um, even TLS headers. Um, so I rebuilt the course content to make it more relevant, um, where we focus on TCP, then even get into like TLS headers and negotiation, which I, I find super useful. Um, every time I'm troubleshooting. Right. So you've probably fallen asleep at night to a few RFCs then if you're, uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I try to, st I try not to do too much tech after, you know, a certain hour. So yeah, 
Now with That's the kids good. and stuff like that, it's harder. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and working from home certainly it it uh, you know the the blurred lines between you know work and home and and all that oh, is yeah, exactly is yeah. sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I've been doing it for many years, so I kind of have this. Um, I, I understand when I leave my office, I'm gone, and I try not to go back in. Um, so, and I found that was very during the pandemic was very important to know know that. And I was even telling my my friends and, and my sister, I'm like, you guys got to leave your place of work inside your house, go somewhere else or put it in a specific corner. So, you know, you're not always working because it's so easy, right? Just to be working 24 seven right now. Yeah, for sure. And I love tech. So I could be doing, you know, building something 24 right? seven. Yeah. Yeah. If I had the space here, I'd probably set up two spaces. I'd have my, like my workspace and then my, you know, robotics play 3d oh, printing nice. space. But right now it's all like, combined into the same space so it's like mm -hmm. we're working on a little project and i hear a ding and i'm like turn over and like hour later i'm like why am i doing that so yeah <laughs> yep yeah. well how, how did you how did you um intersect with f5 technology uh was it through a work project or uh, did you see i guess a work wrong? project like i i got introduced to f5 uh in like 2002 or 2001 or something like that uh, when I joined uh, my first code, my first job at BlackBerry or Research in Motion at that time. So we were purchasing tons of F5, big IP version 4, um, and big 3 DNS. And as a co-op there, my job was always to re-image it, pixie boot those, you know, version 4 F5s, rebuild the base configs so they're ready for production uh, environments. So from there, I kind of did, been doing F5 ever since. Even now, yeah. I joined HashiCorp, I'm still... Um, <laughs> somewhat uh, you know attached to the f5 community because i've built a lot there and i've built a lot of relationships at f5 um and many different customers with it so yeah well, pixie boot man you're you're bringing uh way back yeah. <laughs> way back machine there um did you actually buy like physical f5 hardware servers or were you putting uh, f uh version 4 on on dell's because like my first it was, big the dell's. was like it was dell. the dell's okay yeah mine was like yeah. a dell power edge 2250 i think well, it was a Dell, but it had the had that gray um, kind of clip on it, that plastic clip on the front. I remember it was like six U's or something like that. Um, it was like a, just be called three DNS. So, but gotcha. yeah, they were all Dell Dell yeah. servers itself at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I date myself back. I've been <laughs> using them for a long time. All right. Well, let let let's get into it. What what do you have to share with us today on network infrastructure autom automation? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So. What I want to share is, you know, with my journey with F5, and I've recently joined HashiCorp, um, I've been learning more about service mesh uh, and service networking, and especially automating things, right? So we've chatted many times before about using Terraform or Ansible to automate. I'm kind of trying to push it to the next limit as how we built kind of this event-driven architecture, especially with F5, where I have an app that app gets registered to some type of service mesh and that config gets automatically pushed to an F5 device based on what the app is. So I'm really taking a full hands off of an F5 and letting the service mesh do it, deploy the F5 based on Terraform. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, that's so what I'm you're, using, you you're yeah. using totally third party tools. You're not even really interested in, in the F5 from a standpoint of, of knowing the domain specific language, right? Well, I, I want to understand, to provision the F5, I have to understand declarative onboarding, so the F5DO, and then AS3, right? So um, what I like to call and is the classic mode where everybody just builds VIPs normally with TMSH, and kind of the new way is what I find is AS3. So yep. really, I have AS3 templates that mimic some type of a configuration, because uh, typically, you know, when deploying F5, I've seen probably maybe a max of five different types of configs, HTTPS different profiles, SSL certs, different persistence, and maybe some I rules attached to it. So we'll have a set of templates that you can pick from or the app team can pick from where they just tag their app. And in that tag, and I'll just not demo this to you guys, actually identifies how to build this F5 or how to build this VIP and it will automatically build it. Um, so it's a, it's a really neat process. and kind of helps this, you know, your CID pipeline to kind of uh, fix that deployment issues that I can get into, right? Okay. So if you're yeah. mapping, uh, you know, like uh, processes to tools, you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, declarative onboarding and AS3, you know, in the in the HashiCorp space, what tools are those mapping to? 
Uh, I, as into the F5 tools. So I'm using no Terraform. on the on the on the HashCorp side. So I'm using Terraform console, Terraform and console. I'm using two different products. Uh, Terraform to write the infrastructure as code, and console is from the app perspective to register those apps in the service mesh, um, and then for it to push the configurations itself with with the Terraform console. So okay. and I can go in that in a in a nice little demo, um, and screen share with the team itself. Perfect. Right. Yeah. So, you want to so get into I'll it? Share- yeah, I'll share my screen. Um, you know, I had a little intro about me, so I'm going to skip through this. Um, and, and what I really wanted to, to focus on, um, and, and we'll get right into the demo itself, um, is this DevOps promise, right? DevOps is a term we hear tossed, right, around daily, right? And it encompasses a lot of different tools that, you know, uh, break down different silos of teams, right? You can have different delivery of applications and services, Um and today, right, under the prevailing CIDI model, right, they can push out configurations. And a lot of teams are already using this, especially the application teams itself. When in reality, however, right, most organizations, right, the, the reality has been really very difficult, I find, right, to fulfill the promise of this CIDI organizations really need to align their teams to a pipeline and equip them with the automation tools, right? Right. <clears throat> While, you know, this has been achievable in many continuous integration and continuous delivery stages, there's been really a lot of continuous disappointment in this space, right? Because we have to have, um, and that's coined by my colleague itself, uh, he created that thing, uh, because, we still need somebody to manually maybe do something. So I might need somebody, yeah, I've deployed this app through my GitHub, through my pipeline, through Jenkins, but I still have to add this app to an F5 pool member, or this IP has to be allowed on um, a DAG, a dynamic address group on a Palo Alto firewall or something like that. So what we wanna do and what I wanna demo is to kind of replace this manual process. Right, so when an app team right needs to scale their app or build an app, they have to talk to the server team. The server team gives them an IP address. Then they have to create a ticket to the networking team. The networking team has to get that IP address, assign which resources it needs to go to, update the pool members, update the security groups, the access lists, and push the configuration. And hopefully they get all the information from the app team beforehand, like health checks, um, what network does it belong to? Is it, you know, uh, what kind of ciphers it needs, right? Hopefully that happens quicker, but usually it takes longer. Um, so we want to kind of bring this network infrastructure automation to kind of remove this slow manual process uh, that I've seen. Uh, we want to increase, do increased costs in the organizations that we've seen because, you know, it takes time, right? I've been to organizations where, You know, it takes two to three weeks to deploy uh, an F5 bit or add a pool member, um, right? We want to increase that. And we want it to, based on what the app needs, we want to provision that itself. And also definitely uh, reduce the risks itself. We want to eliminate that itself. So with console network infrastructure automation, uh, what we've done here is we've kind of have this day one and day two of provision. Day or day zero and one and day two. Day zero is where we use Terraform to kind of configure the infrastructure. So, you know, if I'm going to be configuring an F5 itself, right? So let me just open that up for you so you can see. So in here, I have Terraform code that bootstraps an F5. Uh, If I go to my F5 right now, hopefully everybody can see this. I can make it bigger. Right now with this configuration, I have an F5 that's, you know, basic. It's really just, it's been deployed on VMware. So on-prem in this use case, has no virtual servers, no networking configuration, nothing deployed itself. What I want to do is do day zero and day one, provision this F5. So I wrote the Terraform code here, right? It's on my GitHub, it's on my repo. I'll share it to the team after. Um, but it's, it's fairly basic in here. Uh, we have our Terraform provider. So we're using the F5 Terraform big IP provider. Um, in here, we're just you know telling, hey, here's the management IP address and password, right? 
Um, in later versions of this, you know, you could tie this into uh, Vault, which is a secrets management. You can hide all these variables so you don't see it. Then what we want to do, because F5, um, and I haven't played with 17. I know it just came out yesterday. But right. right now, it doesn't come with declarative onboarding RPM. So the package installed. So we actually install the do package, so declarative onboarding. Uh, and we have to wait a couple seconds for it to do that. Once we've installed it, we actually have a template of the big IP config. So I have my big IP template in here. Let me just minimize this. And this is just a JSON file where I have the host name, just a variable, right? Certain things, DNS address, NTP, uh, maybe user accounts, different modules I'm provisioning, so LTM. Uh, the VLANs I'm configuring on here. So I'm, you know, external VLAN and internal VLAN. The self IP addresses that I'm putting in here. Here are the self IP addresses, uh, floating addresses you could add in here, routes. So everything, the base config, the F5 is in this declarative onboarding config. And there's many examples off the F5 website um, and you can do it. Um, certain things like syslog. I just want to add other things that I do add um, you know, what I used to add as an F5 consultant is, you know, certain cipher suites. I'd automatically eliminate, right, you know, the uh, weaker cipher suites out there. So this is our declarative onboarding config, has some SNMP stuff, pretty straightforward. So Real, real quick back, on that before you yeah. move on, uh, just your recommendation for people who are just getting started, do you, do you recommend, uh, like, abstracting as much as possible or keep it all where it kind of makes sense and get get success, make things work, and then start abstracting through variables and, and templates and stuff? Definitely make it work first and then add templates, right? This is a .tmp, it could be a JSON, but this is like a hybrid, this config. And the reason I made it a hybrid, some are variables, some are not, just to show that you can migrate this template to a more hybrid uh, setup or a temp or variable setup itself. But getting right into it, it's, it's, it's super easy. It's not a lot of work. Like, yeah, there's 51 lines of code here, but I'm doing is installing AS3, installing the declarative onboarding uh, on here. And simply, you know, if I go into my terminal here, console, right? So for Terraform, I need to first initiate Terraform. Right, so initiating Terraform is gonna download all these plugins. So it's downloading, as you can see, the big IP actual plugin. I've initiated the config. It has all the actual providers that are required in here. Then I want to do Terraform plan. So Terraform plan is going to allow me to, to show me what changes I'm gonna make. So it actually gives me all the changes in that declarative onboarding, and it's gonna fill in all the information. Hey, I'm doing, declarative onboarding JSON, here's the syslog, the routes, external IP, and it has this plus sign, that plus sign identifies, hey, I'm adding to it, right? So we'll go to Terraform apply. And then what it's gonna do is gonna ask me, hey, do you wanna make these changes? And we see those plus signs. Yeah, I do. So I'm gonna press yes. And then it goes out and talks to the F5 and goes to GitHub with these these scripts and these scripts uh, you just downloaded off the F5 website. Starts downloading the latest F5 declarative onboarding RPM. Um, then it installs that RPM onto the F5. And you'll see shortly here, hopefully on the right hand side, um, it waits the time. Then it says on the bottom here, deploying VO. So now we're deploying the actual uh, configuration on the F5. What you'll see, oh, you didn't catch that. My host name just changed in the top right oh, yeah. corner here, yep. right? Uh, so all of these changes are automatically being provisioned. It's restarting the services, so it went offline, right? And it, it looked like it went to a standalone too. It, th this version right now is just a standalone itself. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This version is just a standalone. So because I'm applying the LTM and I'm provisioning other modules, it will have to be a reboot, right? That's why we call yep. it a day zero, day one. Uh, yep. We have to apply these changes. So... As this is running, we can take a look at network self IP addresses. So boom, our network self IP addresses are configured and our routes are deployed. Uh, we still have no virtual servers because all we're doing is deploying the networking components of um, 
this configuration. And if we click on our packages, right, we just see that the declarative onboarding was uh, installed. And as this finishes, now it installs AS3. Hey, well, that's doing an install real quick. We got a question from uh, uh, Dan Pacheco. You know, advantages, different dis differences um, of using Terraform uh, versus Ansible. Hey, Dan. Yeah, the, the biggest advantage I love with Terraform is the state, right? Terraform knows the state of the actual infrastructure. So you can always reference that in the config itself, right? Ansible is, is kind of stateless. So you have to push configs to it. Terraform knows the state itself. So we have our F5 deployed, right? Just like we would in a production environment. Um, the next thing we want to do is, well, how do we do day two stuff, right? So with console Terraform Sync, right? We console is this catalog and we register apps in this catalog itself. Once we register an app, right? We can tell console sync which services belong to this configuration. And then it's going to push configs to the F5. And I'll show you guys how that's done. So just, just to give you a heads up, here is Terraform, um, <clears throat> Terraform Cloud. Let me just refresh this. And Terraform Cloud uh, is going to hold the state of my configurations. So I'll know any changes that have happened. In here, I have console. This is uh, HashiCorp console, and I've registered three, app, three nodes. So three servers, no app one, two, and three. If we take a look at the configuration, I'll just show it quickly here. Um, this is the config, but so this app is running on Docker on some container uh, and it's registered to my console server. And I have this service, right? This is that service that I'm registering for this node. And this is the important part. In here, the metadata is where I'm selecting how to build that F5 VIP, right? Um, for this instance, here's my VIP address. So my VIP address, the port that it's going to be working on, and the template I'm using. If I look at my uh, F5 workspace repo itself, we have this configuration with a, a bunch of templates. And these templates can be either um, you know, HTTP classes, they can be generic, they can be however you define them, but they're templates. So like I was saying, most customers will have maybe five or six of these different ones. So when that new app gets spun up and it's registered, right, it will automatically add itself. So how does that work? So in this config, I've just from a time perspective, I've registered the apps, right? So I have the maps and I've registered services. I have a web service and I just have a TCP service of one server. Console is also doing a health check on these applications, right? So we're doing a TCP health check on that IP, making sure, you know, that service is online. So what we have to do is when we configure console Terraform sync, this is the actual configuration we have here. Um, we specify our driver, which is the big IP provider like we did before. What's the IP address of the console, the IP address of the big IP we're talking about. And this line of code is where we specify you know, what services are going to be online. So we just give it a name. Here's my GitHub repo. So it's just a public repo where I have all my templates. Uh, the provider is the big IP and we're going to start a web service. So if I go into here, if I take a look at the configuration on console, uh, I just made slight changes to it where I added TCP. So this service TCP and web, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute this so we can see the logs on here. Hopefully this kind of shows nicely. <clears throat> so I've executed Terraform console sync, and this runs as a daemon in the background all the time. When I take a look at my Terraform cloud, I see my workspace. So this is where this, these apps are hosted in this workspace, front end workspace is starting to queue up, right? It says, hey, there's been a change. I've noticed that inside of console, you've registered these apps and these apps are online, right? So I'm gonna go and execute the plan. I'm going to build the configuration based off 
what I saw inside those tags. So it goes in and builds the AS3 config, right? Builds the TCP service, finds the virtual server I had, finds the server's IP addresses. I never put in the server's IP addresses because the app team already registered those services to console. So I have no idea what those IPs are or what ports they're actually running on on the back end, right? And then it goes and builds the F5. So if I, in here, so now it's applying the configuration to the F5. First it does that plan. So it applied the config. I refresh my page. I see that it built my new partition called hmm. front end Terraform, right? Which is great. So now I have my apps or my config on my F5 is built automatically based on what the app team has registered in console, right? But what happens if I shut down a web server? So let's just do this just for fun. Uh, we'll go to web two. So we just copy that IP address. And I'm just gonna SSH into this box. And and sudo reboot. I'm just gonna reboot this device. So the device is being rebooted, right? My node is gone. The node here is done, right? The F5, if I go to network maps, let's go to network, where is this network? A little slow to shut it down. It's shutting down this pool right now, right? So the F5 is rebooting. Wait till F5 sees that health monitor. Which one did I shut down? 52. Okay, good. So now my pool member is dead, right? I haven't done anything. I just destroyed the actual application, right? My, my actual pool, pool member is dead. If I go to my Terraform sync, it said, hey, you made a change. This actually happened super quick. You made a change inside of console in your catalog. And this service now, web, only has one instance. So Terraform automatically, right, is doing another apply. Said, hey, you made a config change, the app should be there, let's clean it up. Because I don't want old IPs, old pool members inside of this config. So same process, right? It runs its apply, so it's already finished, right? It told me what it's going to do. It's going to delete this virtual server. So if I go to my F5 and I refresh it, right, it's gone now. It's, it's, it's out of the actual config. Um, and I did nothing on the F5 to actually provision it. Because based on what the service catalog says and is online, that's what I want the F5 to actually build. Right? That's really powerful because... yeah. That removes, like you said, I, I wrote it down because I loved it. The continuous disappointment. Uh, yes. You know? Nathan Pierce. I don't know if you remember Nathan Pierce. He coined yeah. that. Um, so that, that, that's kind of the power of console NIA. Um, and I can, you know, if I spin this app back online. So if I spin this app back online or add another new app, that inside of the services, right? I have this metadata and you can see this metadata. If we, if we actually go to uh, web tags, no, sorry, uh, node. So I, I, I turned on the server. So this is online. As mm -hmm. you can see, the web is saying, hey, one instance is down. It's gonna do a health check on it. So this tags, so under services, you can see it very nicely here. It's using this HTTP template. It's using that VIP and that port. So literally I added that service back online in here. Let's go to Terraform just so we visually see. It noticed, hey, you made a change inside of your service registry on console. I'm gonna go ahead and apply the configuration again. So I'm gonna go in and add that pool member back in here. Takes a couple seconds, still applying. <clears throat> and, and that's kind of the, the power of this NIA is. And not only can we do pool members, what happens if this IP address has uh, an ACL? 
um, right, in a Fortinet or um, Checkpoint um, or an ACL and AWS, right? We can automatically remove an ad because inside of, you know, this Docker and container world that we're moving towards from an app side, I might not know the IP address. This IP address of the server could be is generated by DHCP automatically. So yeah. as an administrator on the F5, and look, see the, the pool members back online there you go. doing yep. anything, right? right? As an administrator of the F5, I don't really care now what the IP address is, right? As long as it's registered in service and I can tag it. And I also could tag different things. So right now I have a production tag. I can add different tasks and conditions that say, hey, if this is development or UAT or staging, then go to the staging F5, right? Yeah, or even if you wanted to do like some blue green testing or or, or whatever exactly, like that, yes. you can. Yeah, that's a that's a lot because it really takes the 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 production effort away from the infrastructure, mm-hmm. and you're just saying, hey, the infrastructure is ready to go. You do what you need to do with your services, and and it'll just take care of you. That's right, and and your services inside of the console is your kind of um, uh, what's it called source of truth, right? Because mm-hmm. these are the only services that should be running. And this helps with cleanup, right? Like, or shadow IT or whatever yeah. the term was called, where um, you have all these, uh, you know, apps and services deployed. And in my days as an F5 consultant, you know, I, I migrate F5s and, you know, four out of the 10 pool members are done. And what's the server? What's this IP? Nobody knows, right? So those objects fill that F5. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was the, the demo itself. Um, I can- Well, that was amazing. You- yeah, where the repos are. If you quickly share the screen. Oh, sure. Uh, Absolutely. From perspective. Yep. Um, you can just hit up my repo here, just my academy. And this is the actual config to deploy those. Um, it, it's super small. You have our main TF, not, not, not too big, right? I just made a module for it. And then I have all the templates. So in here, I'll be adding different types of templates, cookie persistence, I rules or anything like that. So then customers can use um, and provision it. Um, but the concept is that I have this code that really I don't have to change. All I have to change in here is the AS3 templates. So from a learning curve perspective, all I really need to know is how do I build my F5s in a templated format? Right. right. And, and, and what and, services and, do you slide in and out depending on what type of uh, you know application you support? Exactly, yeah. 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 I'm just always amazed at how how quickly these these scripts and such can actually configure and mm-hmm. populate a device it's <clears throat> remarkable just how fast they can do it oh yeah even like as simple as like if if i edit this and i'm like you know i, I don't want tcp maybe maybe that doesn't belong here right i'm going to delete tcp out of the service then will automatically go into my Terraform cloud, um, kick off the agent and make the config. And, and the nice thing, what I meant with Terraform keeps a state is that every change I've had that I've done and now in the past before, I actually know the state by going to state in here. And I can actually see what was configured on the F5. So I already have a log of what kind of changes, what were made. Um, and then also, you know, there's other things you can set notifications on here where you can, you know, make a web hook and email or Slack that every time an app gets added, you know, a Slack team notification goes on an email goes on. So you're aware of the actual changes being done on your F5 environment. You know, one of the things I was thinking about this morning was, you know, with all the automation and then we have the, the smart speakers or, you know, Siri on the iPhones mm-hmm. where you just tell it to do something like, when are we going to get to that point where you, you can just speak in, okay, I want a secure web server that does this, that has that, that can oh, do that. And it's, it's vocally picked up by the AI and then initiates the, the I would assume somebody's the working on I, I, I've seen things like that. Um, but I, I'm assume somebody's working on that to be honest. Gotta be. Right. that will be the next frontier. On that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think, I mean, that that's there today, right? Because it, you know, it's no different than a Slack bot and you can just type that thing out or you could say it through to, you know, one of your, you know, mm-hmm. Google dots or uh, is Google yeah. a dot? I can't keep them straight. The Amazon uh, um, Echo or, or whatever. But yeah. it's Don't there say today. Too loud, it's also, start going off in my house. 
Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's it's also a little concerning. I, I don't remember the meme, but it was something like with Donald Trump said something and like he's like going after because it thought he said uh, I'm, I'm gonna launch the nuke now or whatever. Oh, yeah. so it's <laughs> like, you know, your 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 voice activation may may or may not be what, what you want exactly. Yeah. Wow. And All right. Well, we, yeah, off, we, I, you know, I deleted the TCP one and it's gone. It's not here anymore. But, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, other than that, uh, I don't want to bore you guys with slides, right? Um, this is uh, kind of how the day two environment looks like um, from my perspective, where I have my console servers and then my apps are registered to it. Once they register, uh, console Terraform Sync does its job. Um, and provisions uh, what is needed based on those tags. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. Wow. That's really cool. Well, as always, Thanks, you know, I'm, I'm always enlightened uh, when when you join us, uh, Sebastian. So, you know, we're super grateful for you making the time to be here. Um, you know, Daniel has a comment here. I uh, think you could do that. Well, yeah. Echo dot Lambda functions. Yep, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, 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 Jaren, um, uh, Terraform optimized for infrastructure <coughs> deployment. Ansible for managing. Yeah, Ansible is more you know your your day two configuration, right? And Terraform for your your day zero and one. But you know, so you know, if if you're just having the Terraform versus Ansible argument, you know, it's not really a an either or. It's a both hand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they work together very well. Like yeah. you'll see tons of organizations use use both, right? And yep. they'll wrap their CIDI pipeline around that, right? So, yep. there's ways to solve everything. Right. right? Just got to do right. it. And you got to change the mindset. That's the biggest thing when talking to customers is the mindset. Like even this, what do you mean I can't log into an F5? We well, don't need to log into an F5 now. Just use its features based off the code that you write for it. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is pretty fantastic. Although, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, um, the nostalgia... Of logging into an F5 con, you know, con <laughs> con <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know what I always say? It's like it's great to abstract it, uh, but it's also great to understand it. So you know, you yeah. start with, "Hey, what are your templates doing?" And it's like that whole uh, HAL 9000. What are you doing, Dave? You know, it's like I, I, I definitely want to know what's going on under the hood. But once I know that, abstract away. You know, automate the boring stuff, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. We got some love from Daniel Wolf for you there, Sebastian. Uh, totally amazing demo and great slides. I concur. That, that was awesome. All right. Well, we will let you get to it, mister. Thank you so much for joining us today. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll hopefully see you again soon. You mentioned a whole lot of TCP dump stuff. And I, I want to start doing some three to five minute featurettes on on TCP dump and and what we might be able to do with PyShark and mm -hmm. Scapy and all that kind of stuff. So I, I may hit you up on the uh, you know, on the side for, for some, uh, some love on that front. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Guys. Yeah. 100%. Man. Uh, I'm cool. always down to talk to you guys. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Appreciate it. Thanks. Sam. All right. That was awesome. I, I love, yeah, pretty I love cool. when we actually get to the brass taxes stuff. So that was really cool. Yep. yep. And our All community right. loves so, those demos too, for sure. Yeah. So Peter, this is the last show of April. And beginning next month, uh, we're we're going to do some some things a little differently. What uh, what do we have in store for us? Yeah, we're going to kind of change things up a little bit. So our flagship live stream, the Dev Central Connect show, the one that we're doing right now, is actually moving to a new day and time. Tuesdays, you join us now for the live stream, eight thirty a.m. Pacific. So we're moving an hour earlier maybe you just got to get up an hour earlier to join us uh, but we also wanted to make sure that we included at least a time that was accessible for our european friends and such so we're going back in or yeah we're we're going back an hour but at nine o'clock when the live stream's over we're then adding an hour and i'm calling it the community after show hour or community hour after show or Something along Office those hours, lines. after show, show, code with me, hang with me, Open whatever you want to call hour. it. Yeah. yeah, whatever you're going to call it. We're going to be around on a Zoom call. You can join us. 10 a.m. Yeah. And so it'll be a lot of fun. You do have to register at uh, community.f5.com to join us for the after shows because we'll we'll drop the Zoom links there. 
And so, you know, if you aren't a member already, register, join us there for, for every Tuesday, um, you know, nine to 10 Pacific, we're going to be, we're just going to be hanging out and, and, uh, you can ask us anything. We won't necessarily know all the answers, but we'll, we'll help track them down. If, if you have some pressing questions that you just need to know. And we may even have some, uh, Dev Central friends on, you know, like our, our friend Leaf or Leslie or other, you know, folks on the Dev Central team. It won't just be us all the time. That's right. Well, Peter, thank you for joining today. I had a blast. Thanks and for having me all week. As a matter of fact, Jason, just me and you. All that's right. Week. It's it's the Peter and Jason show. <laughs> Love it. All right. Take care, community. Next time on Dev Central Connects. Wake up a little early. Wake up. Bum, bum, bum. Wake up a little early. Wake up. Dev Central Connects. Our flagship live stream is moving to Tuesdays, 8.30 a.m. Pacific. We're moving the show up an hour and adding an hour from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on the Dev Central platform, community.f5.com. This is to allow you to join us backstage for the Dev Central Connects after show. Join us every Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. Pacific for the live stream and from 9 to 10 for the community after show hour. Links in the description get you there. Dev Central Connects is live every Tuesday, 8.30 a.m. Pacific. So wake up a little early. Wake up.